What happens after I die? What is the meaning of life? These are but some of the questions that have plagued philosophy since its inception. In answering the first question, many philosophers prompt us to ask a similar question. What happened before I was born? Do I fear the great before? If not, why would I fear the afterlife? In this video, I'm not going to go into religious debate. I'm not going to question the existence of a higher power. I'm just going to ponder my own existence and what that means in my life. Certainly, the only thing that I truly know is my own existence, at least the existence of my mind. I can't speak for everyone else as I can't experience their lives firsthand. I've no idea whether they have the same experiences that I do, or whether they're just a figment of my imagination. As far as I know, I'm the only being in existence. See solipsism. French philosopher René Descartes came up with the Latin philosophical proposition cogito ergo sum, which translates into English as, I think, therefore I am. Although I can doubt the existence of others, I can't doubt my own existence, as it would be impossible to doubt if I myself did not exist. Specifically, he wrote, but I've convinced myself that there is absolutely nothing in the world, no sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Does it now follow that I too do not exist? No. If I convinced myself of something, or thought anything at all, then I certainly existed. But there is a deceiver of supreme power and cunning who deliberately and constantly deceives me. In that case, I too undoubtedly exist. If he deceives me, and let him deceive me as much as he can, he will never bring it about that I am nothing, so as long as I think that I am something. So after considering everything very thoroughly, I must finally conclude that the proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me or conceived in my mind. That's all true, but one thing I do know is that if I yell at another one of the beings, they're likely to yell back at me. If I punch one of them in the arm, they're probably going to punch me back. So there is at least some consequence to being aggressive towards other beings, regardless of whether they are real or not. If I wish to continue living, which seems to be the major, if not only, goal in life, then I must refrain from attacking others. That only improves my chances of dying. That leads me on to my next point. Most of us live our lives avoiding death, or at least not actively seeking it. Yes, of course, you'll find some cultists or severely depressed people who no longer wish to live, but they are certainly the minority. Most of us do not wish to die. We fear it. By fearing it, we increase our survivability. I try not to go walking at night in dangerous neighborhoods because I don't want to be beaten up and killed. I don't live off a diet of vegetable oil and chocolate bars because I don't want to damage my health and die prematurely. I exercise and eat right because I ultimately want to stave off death. Almost all of my actions are either a way to actively prevent my death or a way to take my mind off death. When I play soccer, I'm no longer thinking about my own mortality. When I write the script for a video, it makes my mind focus on something other than death. The exception, of course, is this video, as I'm constantly thinking of death as I'm writing it. Keeping busy is a way for me to delay the inevitable thought that often plagues my mind that one day I will die, and there's not a damn thing I can do about it. So is death such a bad thing? Certainly, in modern society, we have made it into a bad thing. If you think about where companies make their money, it ultimately revolves around either life extension, for example fitness and health, beauty, pretending that we are young, or entertainment and leisure, movies, video games, the internet, holiday packages, etc. In my reckoning, entertainment is just a way for us to get our minds off the D word. However, rationally speaking, death is the most natural thing in the world. Just as trees grow and die, so do people. We don't get upset when flowers die off for the winter. An annual plant is just that. It has one growing season and then dies off. Actually, we find nature beautiful. The flower is beautiful because we know it will die. Its life is only temporary. The puppy is cute for the same reasons. We don't fear the death of the flower any more than we fear what happened before we were born. So why fear death? I once saw an interview with David Suzuki, the Canadian academic and science broadcaster, where he talked about his own mortality. When he looks around at all the beauty in nature, he realizes that he too is a part of nature. When he dies, it's no different from a leaf dying or an ant dying. His body is simply recycled into the great wonder that is nature. We continue to live in that our atoms are forever being reused and recycled. It's a very comforting thought, he says. And I think that is comforting. It is comforting to know that we are just part of a bigger system. 
Nobody disappears when they die, they are simply converted back into their constituent parts. Eventually those parts will go on to form another living being with their own thoughts and perceptions. It's a never-ending cycle of being born, living, and dying. Don't fear death, my friend. It is just the cycle of life that we are all part of. If you don't fear being born, then why fear dying? They have the same essential point on a never-ending cycle. I'll finish with a quote from American novelist Mark Twain. I do not fear death. I had been dead for billions of years before I was born, and had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it.